My name's Scott Bledsoe, if we haven't gotten to meet, and I get to serve here as the lead pastor. And we're in a series called Dream Again. Um, and we kind of extended it. In fact, it's probably going to be a theme for the whole year. And some of you are like, oh, that's great. Y- you know? Because some of you, you really like change. And I like change, too. We'll, we'll, we, we'll change it up a little bit. But, but, but it's, it's 50 years that we have been a church this year. 50 years. And, and for those of you that haven't heard the story, I was praying toward the end of last year. Uh, you know, I'm always about six to eight weeks ahead of where the church is in, in my heart, in my mind. And I'm, you know, thinking about, you know, Lord, where are we going? What do you want to talk about? And, and by the way, the next series after this that will begin two Sundays away, we're going to start talking about the kingdom and our lead in for Easter. And so uh, we were already planning for Easter service around here. And so I, I hope you'll begin to pray for someone maybe to invite to church for Easter. Um, but anyway, I was, I was praying around the month of maybe late September of October, and I really felt like the Lord spoke to me. And I use those words strategically. I felt like the Lord said to me, because you don't normally use the word feel and say but that's how the Lord speaks. I, I, I felt like he said to me, Scott, it's time to dream again. And I felt like it was a word for me. And because I'm the pastor of the church, I felt like it's a word for our church. As a matter of fact, as I, as I think about it, you know, um, you guys wouldn't know this except by observing it unless you're in, you've been in ministry. But most churches after 50 years are a shell of what they used to be. In fact, the life cycle, they, they will, studies bear this out, that really a church sees its effectiveness in about year 13, 14, 15, and then they decline after that. So how, how, do you, how do you account for the fact that household of faith has not done that? We're 50 years in. Well, it's because I believe we were founded with generational thinking, which is what I want to talk to you about today generational thinking. A lot of times people don't think generationally, but God does. God designed us and instructed us to have a generational mindset. And uh, you know, my dad, who, my, the founder, who is right here on the second row, he and my mother, come on, let's give it up for them. Thank you, God, for parents. My mom and dad founded the church and, you know, I'm going to show you a picture of, of the first building on this property later today. But, you know, when you start something, a lot of people get excited about it. Woo! You know, God told me to start a church. But here's the deal. The same God that told my dad to start a church was the same God that told my dad to leave the church and turn it over to me. And let me just say, I was there then. Not nearly as many people were excited about that. <laughs> He was the legend. He was the founder. They trusted him. There wasn't anything wrong with people. And I'm just telling you, if you hang around here, you're going to go through this again. And, and, and it'll wipe you out if you don't have a generational mindset. Come on, somebody say generational. Generational, generational. generational. Um, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, and verse 22, the Bible says this. It says, a good life, notice a good life, this, this translation says it, gets passed on to the grandchildren. See, that's, a, that's God's generational mindset. Well, you, you, you know, you might be tempted to think, wait, that's wrong. A good life gets passed on to the son or to the daughter, to the child. But... When you have generational thinking, you live in such a way so that what you pass on to your children shows up in your grandchildren. There's a big difference. One translation says it this way, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And people think inheritance all the time, and they think in the terms, or in terms of money, and and, and I'm telling you, we have to think differently than that. We have to think differently than just inheriting money and stocks and bonds and land and houses and things like that. I've been a pastor for a long time, and every funeral I do, I talk about forgiveness because I've seen so many families squabble over the financial stuff. 
But God wants us to pass on something more. And so I want to give you a, a, little, uh, a little phrase to help you understand how God teaches us to live. And, and if, you, if you grab this, if you grab this and apply it to everything that you do, you are going to live your best life. And here's the phrase. Picture the end. Before you ever start, picture the end and work forward with the end in mind. Picture the end. That's what advertising does. They show you a picture of a person in a brand new car. And you, 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 can, you can see yourself. Oh my goodness, I could be in that cool truck. You picture yourself in it. And they got you. When you do that, if you ever go sit in it, they got you. They got you. I think new car smell has some kind of opioids in or something in it and people get high and lose their mind and you know pay pay what they're paying for trucks and stuff these days and boats and everything else but you picture the you picture the end first so 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 think about this you got to picture how is it going to end for you see nobody wants to think about the end but the truth is we're all getting older one day at a time and we are going to pass from this life to the next and four people said amen. <laughs> but it's going to be true for the rest of you too. So when I picture my end, this is what I picture. I, want to, I work out because I want to die healthy. I don't want to die sick. Yeah. I want to die healthy. And then I want to be with Jesus. Yes. And I want all of my kids and whatever grandkids there are, I want to know, and if I live long enough and see great grandkids, I want them to serve the Lord and, and walk in God's purpose and calling for their life, whatever that is, whether they work at the church or not, that doesn't matter to me. I just want them to do God's will while they're here on the earth. So that's, that's the end that I picture. And so I, I want to work forward from that point today. And you know, let me tell you the, the, the best way to have your kids fulfill God's purpose is you fulfill yours. Let them see you fulfilling yours. It's not, not badgering them, not telling them what you think they should do. It's you living out yours. In fact, Hebrews tells us this, teaches us this concept. Hebrews 12 and verse two says, keep your eyes on Jesus. And why do we keep our eyes on Jesus? Because he both began and he finished this race we're in, this Christian race. You know, there are a lot of starters today, but there are not a ton of finishers. Can I hear a better amen? You know, I, I wonder how many of you have got an unfinished project at home. I had a lady one time, that, don't worry, these people don't attend church here anymore because the, the husband wasn't a finisher. And they came to see me for marriage counseling, and this is what it was about. He started a bathroom renovation, hit a snag, and never finished. And it was driving her bananas. It was dri absolutely back to the point of, we need to go talk to the pastor. So keep your eyes on Jesus because he both began and finished. This race we're in, study how he did it. And then it's about to tell us, study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. He always kept in mind the end, where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. And I love the way this translation says it. It's not enough that you finish, you've got to finish in God and with God. A lot of people want to be with God, but they not in God. In other words, I'm in his will. He finished in God's will with God. In fact, that's the only place you find the Lord is with you is when you're in his will. And it says, so he could put up with anything along the way. How do you make it through hard times? You got you, you to gotta, you gotta keep your eye on the end. You know, my son is, is redoing a house, and we're all tired. We're all tired. And, and you know, he, you know he, he, he's been there probably way more than I have. He and my wife have been there, probably the people that have been there the most. 
and we just keep encouraging him, it's going to be worth it. You got to see yourself sitting in this renovated house with your family, having dinner, doing life. You got to see that. That's what helps you go to the house again and work on whatever it is needs working on today. And that's how it is in life. He could put up with anything along the way. How did Jesus endure the cross? It wasn't because he was superhuman. It hurt. It was scary for him too. But he kept his eyes on, the verse goes on, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. He knew God's promise to him was that if you'll stay the course if you, will, if you will live your life with the end in mind, then one day you will spend eternity in heaven at the right hand of God the Father. And that's how Jesus did it. And so, um, so that's what we want to do. And you know, you, you got to have, see, that's where this idea of dream again comes along because you got to have a dream that is the finished product of what God wants to do in your life. You know, when I, was, when I was growing up and out in sin and first gave my heart to Christ, I could never see myself preaching. But God gave me a vision. Um, I got prayed for as a very young man. God gave me a vision of myself, a, a, a dream, a God dream, a vision, a word, a uh, vision. Uh, whatever you want to call it. And I was able to, it, I knew that if I just stayed in and with God, I could overcome every challenge that I had in my life. And I had a bunch of them and I could end up doing what God had called me to do. That's why, that's, that's why some of you struggle because you don't have the, there's no end. It's just today. You live in the perpetual today. And if you're not believing God for something better, it makes it very difficult to deal with, with before. And that's what we're doing with this house. I, I've just been amazed um, at the good ideas that my son and his wife and my wife, they're the three main design people that have, they, they've done, I want to show you some pictures of their house. They bought a house, it's, it's about 15 years old. And it was a great house, but it was a 15-year-old house. You know, styles were different 15 years ago. So we have some before pics. This is a pic uh, looking into the kitchen. You know, typical. I think those are uh, either ash or oak cabinets stained. That was pretty standard back in the day. And now I want you to look at it. What someone with a new dream, walk into an old house with a new dream, this is what it looks like today. I think they have another one that shows you the kitchen. And it's all white. A wall has been removed, painted, you know, added some different cabinets. And this is what someone with a new dream can go into an old house. And all of a sudden, it goes from just being something else to like, wow. Now, some of you guys, you're in trouble, man. Your wife just looked at those pictures, and you're about to start renovating. So get the checkbook out. You know, if you can do it yourself, God bless you. If at all you can afford to hire it done, hire it done. That's my advice to you. But you know, one of the things my son did that was, was good was he invited some people who have done it before. Because that's Jesus has done it. He's, he's gone through life, died, and he's in heaven. Like, I don't want someone unmarried giving me marriage advice. Well, I'll be like, what? Here's another one. I don't want someone who hadn't pastored giving me pastoral advice. A lot of free advice out there. And the problem is, a lot of times, we don't, we don't, we don't make our role models the people, the, the right kind of people. It's the people who started and finished. Who are you following on Instagram? Who's the model for your life? There better be someone who's started and, and is finishing well the race that we're running. Because we're not running every race that's being run out there. Okay? And so, he asked people like, uh, there's a guy in our church named Mr. Rando who does sheetrock and paint. Wisely brought him into the mix. Um, there's a guy named Keith that's part of our security team who's a carpenter and cabinet guy. Brought him into the mix. There's a friend of ours named Jeremy who does construction. It's kind of specializes in remodel. My wife, my wife, my wife could be a contractor. I'm telling you, she's great with this kind of stuff. 
She really, she's much better than I am. In fact, you wouldn't know this, but she handles all of the re- facility construction at, for our church. And if you've ever been out to Mount Zion, that was her and her team that designed that. I kind of was there for the, I know construction, so I can make some of the decisions, but the look was, was, was her and, and her team. Um, there, Connor has a friend named Matt that's helped him quite a bit. Um, his father-in-law, Mark Pellegrin, and of course, I've, kind of, I've been there along the way, but it's people that have begun and finished. See, I've, I've remodeled a house. I know what it's like before. I've, I've done it before. And so this truth will serve you well. So if you want to have a great marriage, if you want to raise a great family, if you want to have great kids, if you want to have a great financial end, you need to look at people who have started and finished and ask them questions. Hey, man, how did you prepare for retirement? Some, some of you, you, you know, I, w- I read a stat the other day that 69% of Americans do not have $1,000 saved in the bank. That's staggering. Staggering to me. So you got to find people that start and finish the race and, and, and you begin to live. You, you, you know what you might say? Well, Scott, I've already been through a divorce. God, my, my kids are grown. Um, the marriage is bad. I, I, it's too late for me to start thinking about retirement. No, it's never too late. It's never too late. Why? Because this is a house of miracles. God has the ability to do miracles. You won't know necessarily everything that you need to do, but God will put people in your path who the Holy Spirit will use to provide what you need. See, too often we live situationally and not generationally. We just, I just want to get through COVID. Some of you are, I just want to get through COVID. Well, look, as soon as COVID's over, it's going to be something else. I just want to get through this, this problem in the mind. I just want to get through my kids. They're not sleeping at night. I can just get through so they sleep at night. Well, let me just tell you, they get older, it don't really get better. <laughs> it's fun if you do it the right way. So let's not live situationally. In other words, I just want to get through this issue. Our goal has got to be bigger than tomorrow. Our goal has got to be heaven. Not just for us, but for everybody that we love. And when you lack clarity and vision, when you don't live with a dream, it feels like you're pushing a rope. Have you ever pushed a rope? No, because it's ineffective. And that's what, exactly what some of you feel like is that's what you're doing. I mean, I, I want my family and I, I want us to end up in heaven. I was in Birmingham several years ago and I met a guy and this guy, his whole job was this. He managed the fortune of 13 different families. That's right. 13 families hired him and all he did, he had 13 clients and that's all that he did. That's a great job if you can get it. And so I was talking to him and he told me this. Studies have been done about generational wealth and he said the first generation typically earns it. The second generation fights about it And the third generation, by the third generation, it's all spent and they're back in the same financial situation than before the first generation ever earned it. That's the statistic. And everybody's saying, oh, it wouldn't be me. I I, want to tell you this. It's because, it's because, you know what? People, your, your kids don't value what you value. They don't see things the same way you see them. The things that make a big deal to you right now, I guarantee you, your kids don't care about. There's some property right over here. I used to live right over, right over off of Brittany Tower Road. And I, I owned two acres, and I had a, a starter home on one acre. That was the house I remodeled. And I was going to build a forever home, and I wanted to buy some land um, out through to an, a, a road nearby there. And I contacted the lady who owned it. She lived in Chicago. She was an older, an elderly woman. And guess what? She wouldn't sell it. You know why? Because old people value land. But if you drive by there now, 
there are houses going up on that land. You know why? She died. The land passed to her kids. And you know what they did? For sale. They have different values. They just have different values. So I want to encourage you that legacy is not leaving something for people. Your legacy is not what you leave in dollars and cents and acreage and stocks and bonds. Because I'm going to tell you what your kids are going to do. They're going to spend all that. Legacy, it's leaving something in people. What are you leaving in the people around you? What are you leaving in your children? What are you leaving in? You know, we tell our parents, because my parents are aging, and what I'm so thankful for, my parents left in us all of it, because I have two sisters, there are three of us, and all of us, they left in us a legacy of faith and work and wisdom and financial responsibility. And the truth is that, that none of us need their money because we're all successful in and of ourselves because of what they left in our life. Again, I tell you, I see people, they, their, their parents die. And Vanessa's got a story in her family of a grandmother that died. And, and, and some of the family swoops in like, like buzzards and start grabbing trinkets, things that don't, don't, they don't meet. I mean, I'm not talking about even thousands of dollars worth of stuff. And the family's in an uproar. That's what happens if all you leave is money. But if you'll leave wisdom and faith and character, come on, if you'll leave, um, if you will leave a story of, of excellence, and if you'll, if you'll leave the legacy of being a dreamer and, 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 and fulfilling God's purpose in your life, then when you leave that in your kids, you don't have to worry about, is it enough? Because they will have the things they need to make it. And I want to tell you how to do that today. From the book of Psalms, chapter 78, uh, I just want to read these seven verses, and then I want, to, I want to talk through them, and then we're going to have communion together. For those of you that are watching online, you might want to go ahead and begin to gather your communion stuff together. I want you to receive communion with us. Um, get a cracker, a piece of bread, and then something to drink. It doesn't matter if it's grape juice. It doesn't matter if it's pita bread. It doesn't matter if it's matzo cracker because this is symbolic, but, but I, I think you're going to find a lot of, a lot of uh, meaning in what we do today. Psalm 78, the psalmist writes, my people, listen to my teaching and listen to what I say. And he says, I will speak using stories. Guys, I want to go ahead and do that first point here. And I want to tell you, if you want to leave a legacy, if you want to leave something in your kids, the very first thing you want to do is you want to, you want to tell stories. You tell stories to build faith in other people. Too many times, parents start with scripture. And I'm not downplaying the role of scripture, but you want to tell stories. I didn't even really realize this because I was in church all of my life, but as I look back, I, I heard, you know, one of the things that built my faith in God were the stories that my parents told and I want to tell some of those stories. I may have the details wrong, but I got the, the bones of the fact right. I, you know, my, I'm not a big detail guy. But I want to tell you how we ended up on Airline Highway here. Is, um, my dad had started the church, had left the, the church that he was in. He'd received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There was about 35 people meeting in that, that building on 431 I showed you a week or two ago. And, and um, so we began to plan for a permanent location. And one day my dad was in town and a guy that did not come to church gave him a $300 handshake. Do you know what a $300 handshake is? The guy had $300 and he shook my dad's hand and gave him the money and just said, I feel like I'm supposed to give this to you. I don't even know if the guy was a believer. And my dad happened to be either that day or very soon after that was about to meet. There were three acres for sale on Airline Highway. Okay? And, and, and in fact, this is another part of the story. There was, there was a man who tried to give my dad property, six acres of land, over on Cannon Road. And you talk about house of miracles. My dad turned it down. 
Have you ever known a pastor to turn down free land? I actually have turned down property too. There was a lady in our church that wanted to give me her place. And I said, ma'am, I ain't never going to build a church out here. But the Lord had spoken to my dad and said, the ministry needs to be on Airline Highway, not, not on Cannon Road. That land, I believe, it's either at or near, that land was right there, is now Stevens Park. It was the Stevens family. Anybody remember the Stevens Meat Company? was a cattle slaughterhouse that was located right where the, where the Walmart is today. That was way back before some of your time. So, so this guy gives my dad a $300 handshake. Um, he goes to meet with the owner of the land and gives him the $300 and says, I want you to hold it. I'm going to arrange financing. He goes to the Bank of Gonzales, which is no more, and dealt with a lady named uh, Miss Wagaspak. And Ms. Wagaspak said, you know, brother, it ain't nothing ever made it on airline south of Prepare Road. That's my interpretation of how she talked. <laughs> and my dad told her, he said, well, you know, Ms. Wagaspak, maybe God had never been involved in anything on airline highway south of Prepare Road. And the bank required 10 men to sign on that original loan for three acres of land and probably a building. So 10 men signed it. What if I told you we were building a new $10 million project and I need need 100 men to sign on the loan with me? Come on, line up right here. Come on, who's ready? We got the pen. Man, I tell you, you guys would run out of here like... So, so then they start building the building and the Lord speaks to my dad and said, I think, I think the building was 30 by 70 was the original size. And the Lord spoke to my dad and said, extend it 30 feet. I'm going to send a guy to pay for it. And my dad's like, Lord, are you sure? But hey. God, if you, if you said so. So he, and, and back then we did all the work ourselves. You know, we'd, we'd have work days on Saturday. And I guess it was a Saturday. He told the men, hey, we're going to extend it 30 feet. And can you imagine the 10 men that signed the loan? Like, like what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> we're making it bigger now? Can we get a few more signatures on this loan? <laughs> But no, they, they believed my dad. They did it. I think it was the next Sunday, if, if I have the, the details straight. If not, it was a, one Sunday after. There was, there was, I think it was a new person at church. There was a check in the offering on that Sunday that covered the price of the new extension. See, I just want to tell you, is, is this, is a, this has always been a house of miracles. And I heard those stories as I was growing up. And as I got older, I would say, tell me the story. And I'd have my mom and dad tell our staff, tell the story about how this happened and that happened. And a lot of you think this idea of campuses was either my good idea or it's a recent idea. But the truth is my dad talked to me about the fact, because we had a lot of pastors that came through this church, and he said many times, I should have started a campus he didn't know to call it, but I should have planted a church in Galvis, in Prairieville, one over in Dutchtown. You know, and he could have utilized these guys that were from Miranda. Now, they've all gone, and, and they, many of them have, have, have ended up with great churches. But he had that idea of campuses. So when the people of Mount Zion came to us with the campus, where did I have the faith from? I knew it was God because it was financially, it was very, it was a good deal but I'd heard my dad talk about it. So I knew it was part of the vision, part of the dream of God for this house. And I tell you what, God's got a dream for your house too. And if the dream you are living is more like a nightmare, then God wants to help you dream again. So tell stories. How are you going inf- to, how do you influence your friends? How do you influence your children when they're small? You know, well, I want to bring them to church. That's good. I'm going to read the Bible to them. That's good. But tell them stories of the miracles that God's done in your life. Let me tell you about Connor and Megan in this house. Um, they came to our house one Saturday night, and they, they were frustrated. They were looking for a home, 
And they said, everything in Ascension is too expensive. It's outside of our budget. It's not, it won't be even any bigger than the house we live. They're expecting a second child. And this is what they told us. They said, you know what? We're going to have to move to Denham Springs. You can get more house for the same amount of money in Denham Springs. And Vanessa and I immediately said, no, you cannot move our grandchild to Denham Springs. (laughs) Absolutely not. And then we told them the story of how God blessed us with our house. And we have an incredible story. I won't tell you, but we told them the story. Just trying to encourage them that, that God has a plan. God has a dream. God knows where the houses are. The next Sunday, I come to church. I'm going through my regular routine, talking to the dream team. We all get here early before you guys show up. And I'm talking to a man in our church named Johnny Wilde and his wife, Becky. And he says... I'm putting my daughter's house up for sale. And he starts bragging about this house. I said, come here, talk to my son. (laughs) I brought him right back over here in Vanessa's office. They talked and Connor and his wife looked at it and they made a deal. And I'm telling you, he's getting a better house and it's within his budget. And it's not in a subdivision. This is on an acre of land. I'm telling you, I pray, God, give me my, I heard my dad's stories, and I said, God, I want my own story of miracles, and I'll tell you this, I want my children to have their own stories of God's goodness. And let me tell you this, real faith will produce real life stories. You say, I don't have no story. You need to check your faith. Because faith, when you have a real faith, God calls you into deep water. He calls you to risk, to do things nobody in your family's ever done. Maybe things that you've never done, things that you are uncomfortable in your flesh with. And and you know why God calls you there? Because he's trying to breathe a new dream into your life. He's trying to bless you. You can stay comfortable. Oh, I don't raise my hands. I don't talk in tongues. I don't give to the church. I don't lead small groups. I just go on. You, you, can, you can stay where you're at, where it's comfortable and where it's safe. But God's trying to breathe a new dream in your life. And you're going to have to have real faith. And let me just say this. I believe in God. It's not real faith. The Bible says the devil believes in God. You think the devil has any faith? If he did, he wouldn't be the devil he'd still be Lucifer, an angel of light. He'd still be an archangel in the kingdom. The Bible says it, that the, the devil believes in God. Real faith. Here's the second thing I would encourage you to do is when you tell these stories, make Jesus, make the Lord the star of your story. You know, it's been proven. You know who people like to talk about the most? They like to talk about themselves, what they bought, what they did, how people offended them. They like to talk about themselves. If you ever want to be a good friend to people, you just talk about them because it's most people. You know, they say this, that your name is the, is the most beautiful sounding thing in the, whole, in the whole world is your name. You love to hear your name. If, if, if my, you know, when I take a picture of my kids, you know the first thing they do? They look at themselves in the picture and then they criticize me for my lack of photography skills. <laughs> you made me look bad. My eyes are closed. Oh my God, Dad, what are you doing? My son, who's on the tech team here, has threatened to take my Instagram account away. <laughs> but in the book of Psalms, it says, We will tell about his power. And the miracles he has done. And I I just, I I cannot tell you enough, God wants to give you a story. And then when you talk about that story and you give the Holy Spirit credit. My dad was phenomenal at this. My dad was probably the most humble man I've ever met. God used him in in powerful ways. And, And what God did through his leadership of our church, we touched the world. But when you talk to him, My dad was so humble, and he would always give God the glory. And I love that. uh, Hopefully, he's put some of that in me. But you know what? Even 
even having great parents. And I grew up in a great church with great parents, but I went to college, I got hooked on pot, and in the world, I needed my own story of God's deliverance. September 1985, I raised my hand, and the Lord Jesus Christ set me free from the bondage I was in. That's my story. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Here's the third thing I would tell you out of that verse is real, uh, real faith is trusting God with my life. See, that's the issue. The issue is always, can I trust God? That's where some of you, you're struggling with that today. You know, we'll, we'll give you an opportunity to give. The reason some people don't give is they're like, I don't know if I can trust God. I need this money. I, I need it. I got bills. I got kids. The youngest one needs braces. They want to go to out-of-state colleges, whatever. I got cars to buy. And you, you're wondering, can I trust what the Bible says? If you're single, you know, I, I know what your struggle is. Can I trust God to provide for me a, 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 a godly spouse? Or should I just do what everybody else does and get on eHarmony, Tinder, whatever, and, and find one that way? Oh, come on, you ain't, come on, I'm preaching better than y'all are amen in this morning. Can I trust God with my life? Can I trust God with my marriage? I mean, look, you don't know my spouse. They mean. If I start apologizing and serving, oh, they're going to take advantage of me, Scott. You, you don't, can I really trust God? Can I really trust God. And that's what the scripture says in verse 7 at the end of that psalm. He says, so they would all trust God and would not forget what he had done and would obey his commands. See, when you tell stories and you lift up the name of Jesus, it enables your kids, your friends, your family, it enables them to put their faith in God. My dad talked about God in such a way and had the stories to back it up that I was like, you know, God would probably do the same thing for me. And he'd probably do the same thing for you. I, I, I just, I, I, see, I see even Christian believers and they're buying into the world's way of trying to have great family and great marriages and we think it's about uh, spectacular vacations and, and uh, you know, it, it's, about, it's about bigger and better houses and cars and, and I don't have anything, I don't have a problem with any of that stuff but I'm telling you, what matters? See, I grew up in a pastor's home, grew up in a great church and got out there and got bound by the devil. Education is no, education cannot keep your child's heart free. Financial gain cannot keep your mind and your heart free. But Jesus can. And I want to tell you the best place to do this. They're going to, the guys are about to move a, a, a prop into place and I'm going to do the rest of this teaching from, from a table because the very best place in all the world to do all of this stuff is around the table. The table. Uh, I don't think we fully understand that the spiritual significance of the life that happens around a table. Um. And I know we don't practice it today. You know, one of the things I loved was every Sunday, my dad would preach and my mom, when I would get up on Sunday morning, my mom was cooking Sunday dinner. Come on, moms don't hardly do that very much. And I get it. Look, everybody's working today. I get it. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to put on you the fact that you need to cook. Because whether you, you can buy them, you can buy it, but the table is non-negotiable. Because something tremendous happens at the table. At every table, there are seats. And here's the question you want to know is, can I get a seat at the table? Can I get a seat at the table? And I thought about, and when I grew up, you know, we all sat in the same place 
for every meal. In fact, my dad and the, the way my mom and dad did it, we ate dinner every night at 5.30, not 5.31, 5.30. And you were expected, I can remember, <laughs> I'd be off playing, no watch, no concept of time. And I'd hear, God! <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, supper time. <laughs> and I'd get my seat at the table. Well, isn't that what the scripture says in the 23rd Psalm, which is a lot of people loves that. One of the lines in there says this. He says, you prepare a table for me. Or he, actually, the scripture says, you prepare a table before me. And here's what I would tell you. There's a seat at God's table for you. And again, this is the place, this is really the place where my faith got ignited. Because dad would come home fired up about whatever happened. Yeah, we talk politics, we talk sports, we talk chores. Sometimes we got fussed at. <laughs> we got told to use our napkin, you know. But it was there where my mom and dad would talk about what God was doing in lives, in their life and other people's lives, and hear the stories about God's goodness. Some of my fondest memories are when we would have guest speakers into the church, and I would just get to sit around the table. And Sister Peggy was in our home many, many, many times, and just hearing the stories. I preached a revival here. This is what God did. And I heard the stories. I'm telling you, it's stories that build faith. That's why you go to the movies and not the library. Who's been to the library lately? Wave at me. About five hands. Who's been to the movie in the last six months? Or watched the movie on TV? Every hand. Hey, you know, honey, how about we, how about we go have a little dinner and go to the library? Nobody ever said that. <laughs> and I love the Bible. The Bible has its place. It really comes into focus once you're a believer. But how do you build faith? You build faith in your kids by telling the stories of God's goodness. And I want to encourage you to begin to do that if you're not. Because I, I know you want to transmit your values to the next generation. You say, well, my, my kids are out of the house. Don't worry. If you cook, they will come. <laughs> That's what I found. If you want to get rid of kids, get rid of Wi-Fi. If you want to attract kids, cook. It was around the table where Connor and Megan told us, we're going to have to move to Denham Springs. It was around the table I got to tell them a story about our house. In fact, Lord willing and not too many clashing uh, schedules, we'll all gather around a table today and have a meal as a family. You know what I love about the table? Even my little grandson, Brooks, he's not even one year old. Put him in a high chair, he's got a place at the table. And I'm going to tell you a story about the table. In the Bible, there's a story of a, of a young man named Mephibosheth. He was the grandson of King Saul in Israel. He was the son of Jonathan. And when Mephibosheth was a young man, because of his grandfather's sin, he lost the kingdom and they lost the war and their enemies defeated them. And while his nursemaid was carrying him away to try to, to, to save his life, she dropped him and he got crippled. And so he lived as a crippled man. And then they lost the kingdom. But then God had a, a brand new dream for Israel. And King David ascended to the throne. 
And one day, David, and this is a beautiful picture of what God does first. One day, David, um, he began to ask about Saul's kids and grandkids and relatives. And someone told him, well, there's Mephibosheth off in this little bitty town in the backside of nowhere. And David said, get him and bring him to me. Because here's what I'm convinced. Sometimes it's because of none of, of our own doing, but maybe... You know, it, it could be because you had relatives that rejected God and you've grown up in dysfunction and all kinds of things. Maybe people have done stuff to you and, and it's just been terrible. But David found Mephibosheth and he said, I, I want to be kind to you. And he restored to him. He said, Here, I'm restoring to you all of your grandfather's land and farms and I'm providing servants to work it. But he said, you, you're going to sit at the king's table. And that's exactly what God does for us. And you know the great thing about when we're at the table? Because at the table, you couldn't see Mephibosheth's condition. He was crippled, but at the table, we're all equal. You know, we get around the table. Even my, my, my grandson, Brooks, he gets in a high chair, and he's got a place at the table. And that's exactly what God, he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I'm telling you what God wants to do is, God says, I want you to sit at my table. But you got to believe there is a place at the table for you. I want you to bow your head this morning. And we're going to receive communion in just a moment. So those of you that are watching online, uh, you know, you get your stuff together and uh, ministry team, get ready to, to hand out communion to those who may not have it. But, but maybe you're here today and you don't feel like you've got a seat at the king's table. And that's what God wants to do. When Jesus came, he paid for whatever sin either you or was committed by your family or was committed against you. Jesus went to the cross and with his own body and his own blood, he paid the penalty for sin. And so God extends an invitation to you now and says, you can be a part of the family. And everything that God had for you originally can be restored to you. We call it salvation. People confuse it with joining a church. It's much more than joining a church. People think it's getting religion. It's much more than getting religion. People think it means, you know, you change your life. It's much more than life change. It's about being redeemed back to God's dream for your life. If you're not living God's dream for your life and you're not seated at the Lord's table, I want you to know God has a place for you. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let me ask you this question. Are you right with God? Because I came here to tell you, Jesus went to a cross for you. And the Father is extending a seat at the table where your weakness will be covered and your sin will be covered and your future restored. And ultimately, that future is in heaven with him. You say, Scott, that's what I want today. I'm thinking about the end today. And I want to end up with Jesus. Well, make the decision right now to give him your life. And here's what I want you to do. Take this step of faith. Just raise your hands. Say, Scott, pray for me today. Who can I pray for? Yes, sir. Who can I pray for? I want to give my heart to Christ. I want to see the table. Yes, God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. You can put your hand down as soon as you're ready. Yes, God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, lift up your eyes. Look at me, and we're going to pray together. Pray this with me out loud. Say, Jesus, I believe that your life on the cross given for me removes the curse 
of sin from my life and restores me to my place at the king's table as a child of God with God's future for me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen.